All right, just before we get into, we're actually launching a new series today, and we're going to take a journey through the uh, letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. It's called First Corinthians, and we're going to spend quite a few weeks working our way through this. But before we get started on it, here's a question I'd like you to think about and answer to. If you could identify one or two things that you think would be clear evidence that a person is living in a fleshly or carnal way, what do you think those one or two things would be? The, the top evidences that a person is being fleshly or carnal, okay? You got something in mind? All right, now share that with the person next to you and see what they have to say. See if you, maybe you came up with the same thing. Just check with each other. This is what's fascinating, and it surprised me when I started reading through this, and it is simply this. According to the Apostle Paul, the clearest evidence of being carnal and fleshly is the inability to get along with someone you disagree with. That's what Paul says is the highest evidence of carnal, fleshly approach to life and it's spiritually immature. See, we often think that carnal, fleshly stuff is the breaking of certain rules, dishonest and destructive behavior, and it can certainly include those things, but it's not limited to it. For example, the same author, when he wrote to the church in Galatia, would say this, the acts of a sinful nature or the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, it sounds like the list that probably we were coming up with, right? Idolatry, witchcraft, but then look at this turn. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That Paul identifies over half the things that constitute sinful behavior is actually how we treat each other. And just as surprising as he goes on and he identifies evidence of spiritual fruitfulness in your life. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance. That means you have to put up with somebody. How many have somebody in your life you have to put up with? How many are sitting next to them? No, don't raise your hand about that. <laughs> and here's what you should know. There are people in your life who have to put up with you too. Kindness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Not only are half the things listed that are sinful behavior how we treat each other, but half the things listed as spiritual behavior is how we treat each other. Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church because the city in Corinth didn't understand something significant. They didn't understand that spirituality is not just adding religious words or religious symbols to the life you're already living. It's not just who you hang out with or where you show up. There's more to it than that. And because they didn't understand that, there were some very unhealthy things that were happening in the church. So in this series, we're going to look at what the cultural influence is on the Corinthians. And by the way, we're going to examine what it was for them because if we just try to examine our own culture and then read it into that letter, uh, we might get a misrepresentation of what Paul was trying to teach. We first have to understand what it meant to them to understand what it means to us. So the Apostle Paul was writing a letter to a, a believers who were in Corinth. It was a very prosperous uh, city. It was an international city. If you're looking for the modern-day equivalent, it would probably be like Hong Kong. And it's a strategic location for all kinds of international trade. And it was a huge sports city, too. In fact, the Isthmian Games took place there every other year, and they were second only to the Olympic Games. And in that city, because of its trade and its sports, this is where you would go if you wanted to get wealthy and if you wanted to meet influential people. So there was this interesting concept in Corinth called grace. It's a word that Paul uses over and over and over. In the Greek language, the word is charis, and so it has to do with grace. But their idea of what grace was was actually something that was very destructive to the church. When Paul said grace, they heard what it meant to them, not what God meant. 
And so how it meant there is that in Corinth, there were lots of very wealthy individuals. They had done very well economically. And they believed that wealthy individuals should assist those who were struggling or difficult, having difficult times, or even help those kind of climb the social ladder a little bit and improve their economic opportunities. And so they would do that. Wealthy people would give gifts, grace, to people who were struggling. And that's what that was called, grace. They would give gifts, except that when they would give a gift, there were all kinds of strings that were attached. If you received a gift from a wealthy person in Corinth, it meant that you had a lifetime of loyalty to that individual. It was so powerful, this bond, that people were actually worried about who they received gifts from. You might not receive a gift from someone because you were afraid of the kind of person that they were. In Corinth, a gift always meant that strings were attached. So the way that that would work is if you wanted to kind of improve your lot in life, then you would make yourself available to some very wealthy people. And once again, there were lots of them in the city. And this is how you become upwardly mobile. This is how you kind of self-promoted. And there would be all this opportunity to be able to get better. And here's the challenge. People started doing the same thing in the church that they were doing in the culture. See, back in those days, they didn't have rooms like this for people to gather. They would have to meet in wealthy people's homes. And so they would meet in those homes because they could accommodate 50 people without any trouble, and people could gather and hear biblical teaching, except when a wealthy person opened their home, you kind of decided that that was the opportunity. I would go to that person's house because now I can get good connections and I can make good investments and I can find out where the real movers and shakers are and I can benefit from being part of that church family. And Paul says this is a really unhealthy way to approach this. Paul was deeply convinced that the Holy Spirit was not supposed to be used for self-promotion. That the purpose for coming was not just to better ourselves in society, but to let the grace of God transform our lives. So Paul actually wound up staying 18 months. This letter is written while he's in Ephesus, but this is, uh, I think, the second longest place he ever stayed anywhere because he knew how strategically important Corinth was to the spread of the gospel. So that brings us to this passage we're going to look at this morning in 1 Corinthians beginning in verse 10. Chapter 1, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you, what's the next word? Agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's house, household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, well, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. That's kind of the nickname they had for Peter. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So none of you can say I was baptized you were baptized in my name. Uh, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. I think that is one of the most startling statements, that it is possible to empty the cross of its power. The way they are treating each other nullifies the power of the cross. I'm going to kind of skip over into chapter 3 because there's a couple of verses there that help us understand this as well. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still, what's the next word? Worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, because you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not yet ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and the other, I follow Paulus, are you not mere human beings? Paul understood what happens when people get divided. 
Now, in, I didn't read through it, but in verse 10, we see his reference to the name Jesus Christ. And in the first 10 verses, he does that 10 times. And what he wants to do is to drive home a point that our identity has to primarily be in Christ, not in our culture, not in the patron, the person who's giving us gifts. Something had happened at Corinth. They were not representing or reflecting who Jesus was. They were representing and reflecting who their investors were. And that was creating a problem. And back then, they called those investors patrons. The first problem that Paul wants to address is division. This is the issue. He's, it's the primary thing that he has to talk to the Corinthian church about. And it's not that they were fighting over heresy. It was the unintended consequences of living without thinking how what they did every day in the culture was affecting what they did when they came to the house of God. So the Corinthian believers in the culture would seek prestige and alliances. Who can I align with that will make it better for me? And this is what they started doing in the church. And they started saying this, well, I follow Paul. Now, nobody says that if they think Paul is a bad teacher. I'm, I'm I follow Paul. He's terrible. I don't know what to tell you. He's, he's, but, you know, that's who kind of brought me to Christ. I guess it's too bad for me. No, that's not what they say. I follow Paul. Why? Because Paul is the real spiritual authority. And someone else says, well, I follow Apollos because we know he's better than Paul. And I follow Peter. And they just start going to this arguing to prove that, here's the thing, when you create subgroups, what you unintentionally say is we are better than somebody else. And that is always a problem in the Christian faith. So Paul reminds them, we are co-workers. I and Apollos have labored together. I planted, he watered, but it's God that made everything grow. We're not in competition with each other. We're actually working together. But they thought that the, their leader, their patron, their household that they met in, it was made them wiser, and it made them more spiritual, and it made them better, superior to others. And so Paul had to address this. The Corinthian believers were actually more concerned about who baptized them than the fact that they were baptized into Christ. You know, they're going, well, Paul baptized me. Well, Paul baptized me. And Paul says, I actually didn't baptize that many of you. The most important thing is not who baptized you. The most important thing is who you're baptized into. I was just the person who got to do that for a few of you. That's why he says this is so important that we deal with this. And he's not making the argument, so I'm the real authority here, and you need to all be following me. What he's saying is, is that Christ is the real authority. A divided church cannot reflect God. Uh, if you were to take a mirror and it would be fractured, it would not give an accurate reflection back of the image. And when the church is divided, we can't accurately reflect God. Not only that, but God exists in triune reality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they are always in unity. They are always in agreement. There has never been an argument between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when the church is divided, we are actually not reflecting the truth of the unity of God. He tells us Christ is not divided. In fact, Christ is the one who came so that everything that does divide us could be done away with. So unity does not require you to always agree. It requires you to surrender the perception that you are always right. How many know we all have different preferences? Is there anybody who has a color that is your favorite color other than blue? Yeah? What is it? That's wrong. It's wrong. Anybody else? Chrome? That's really wrong. <laughs> I was raised in a house where we only had eight crayons in our box, and chrome was not one of them. So how about you? Red. Wrong. Wrong. The only right answer is blue. That's right. You know what it is. Why is it we have to think that as soon as somebody thinks differently than us, that they are wrong rather than they're just different? 
Why can't we have personal preferences that don't make us better or worse than someone else? It's just what we prefer. And you know why? Because often when we have preferences, we want to impose them on others. And then what we do is we try to use spiritual language to make it sound like that's God's preference too. And we all know when you get to your mansion in heaven, it, the walls are going to be painted blue. <laughs> well, this is just foolishness. Private agendas are not the same thing as a greater purpose. And that's why Paul deals with this so powerfully. We are not called to reflect our culture. See, our culture is, it, 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 it embeds itself in us in ways that we can't possibly imagine. And if you ever travel internationally, you get a little bit more of a sense of this. And, and by the way, we live in a culture that is one of the most affluent and prosperous cultures that has ever existed in human history. Now, I have been to places in the third world nations of our world where all of the conveniences that we have are not available there. I've been places where you shower with a bucket. That's all you get. I won't even tell you what you do regarding bathroom stuff. And the food, you're never quite sure what you're going to get. And by the way... Uh, in the Western world, our immune system isn't as strong as it is in other places of the world. They rinsed my plate before they put food on it in the well water in the back of the church, and just a couple drops of that water made me so violently sick I lost 10 pounds in a single week. I don't recommend it as a dietary approach. And I came back and people asked me, they said, do you feel guilty for all that we have? And I said, no, I feel grateful for all that we have. But often this is what happens. When we try to share grace, what we also try to share is our culture. And Western civilization is not the same thing as Christianity. And we have to learn how to separate those things. We have to learn how to think differently about them. And this is challenging for us. So we're not called to reflect our culture, but we're also not called to hate our culture. Sometimes people in spiritual environments just kind of rail at everything that they see is wrong with the culture. And to be sure, our culture has its faults and failures. And so they think that their job as spiritual leaders is to stand in front of the room and criticize, condemn, and rail against the culture. And Paul says, that doesn't help you change anything. Our job, we are called to challenge our culture by showing what life in Christ actually looks like. We're not called just to be what's around us. We're not chameleons. We're not called to just curse everything that's around us. We're not condemners. We're called to challenge the culture around us by the life that is in Christ. So let me give you a little bit of example of this. I think one of the prevailing spirits in our culture is the spirit of fear. I think that when our world, when someone wants you to support something or they want you to comply with something, they often use fear-based language to get you to go there. And I'm going to talk about something right now, and I'm not referring to any political person or any political party. I'm just making a point. I'm actually politically neutral in this, so don't assume that I'm talking about somebody. But everybody who runs for office starts out by saying, if you elect me, I will try to make our country better in the following ways. But before the election is over, their conversation degenerates to, if you vote for that person, this is what's going to happen to you. So you better vote to me. It's all fear-based language. Our world is very afraid. It is constantly afraid. And we are told to be afraid. And here's the challenge. We think sometimes that when we come into the house of God, that if we use that same approach, that fear-based approach, that that's how we will get people to support and comply with what Scripture says. And what Paul wants us to know is, you are simply reflecting the culture that you are in, and you are mimicking the culture that you are in. But God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. That's what God has given to us. So we need Need to be cautious about how we use our language because we might get what we want from people, but it is not promoting the change that God desires in people. Does that make sense? So that's what happens when we surrender to the spirit of the age or to the, the prevailing concepts in our culture. By the way, if you've noticed, uh, we have more interruptions and we have more people talking over each other. And if you ask them, why do you keep interrupting that person? 
they will always say the same kinds of things. It's because I'm so passionate about what I believe. I just feel like everybody needs to know what I'm saying. What I will tell you is that is not true. It's not. What is true is that they are afraid if somebody listens to what the other person is saying, they will agree with them and they will lose their opportunity. So you have to talk over them. Or even worse, if I listen to them, I might think something different, and I don't want that to happen. And so our inability to listen in our culture is not born out of passion. It's born out of fear. You can't always tell fear because people shake in their boots. Sometimes they yell really loud. And that's what happens in our world. So why can't we just have a different opinion? Why can't we just say, that's their preference, this is mine? Why does someone have to be right? Why does someone have to be wrong? Paul says that's not the way of the cross. It's not the message of the gospel. It's not how Jesus lived in ministry. Human wisdom, which is a big thing that Paul talks about all through this letter, segregates people. It moves people into different categories. I heard this this week. There are two kinds of people. How many know there's always people trying to divide the world into two kinds of people? And, and this person said there are two kinds of people in the world. The people who divide people into two kinds of people and the people who don't. <laughs> just, I don't know what to do with that exactly. What Paul wants us to know is that the grace of God has come into our lives and it has told us that we all have equal access to salvation. There's no ethnic advantage. There's no economic advantage. There's no gender advantage. You can be Jew or Gentile. You can be slave or free. You can be male or female. Every single person is welcome to receive the grace of God that was made available through the cross of Jesus Christ. How many are glad that God makes his grace available to everyone? Everything God is doing in our world is made known and made possible through the cross of Christ. It's the only thing we have left to boast about. We shouldn't be boasting about anything other. It's not, well, my pastor is the best pastor, or my church is the best church. Do you know what? We are not the only church in Charlie. There are lots of churches in Chai Lai, and I know most of the pastors, and I have the highest respect for all of them. I think they are dedicated, godly individuals who serve God with all of their might and all of their strength. I think their houses of worship are attempting to share the grace of God with our community so that every person, regardless of their preferences, will have access to the grace of God. Don't you think that's a good thing? And that's, that's how we should see each other. So our faith allows the cross to reveal who God is and define who we are. You see, our faith does not exist by our religious words, and it is not a matter of our religious symbols. Our faith allows the cross to reveal who God is. You want to know who God is? Learn the cross. You want to know who we are? Learn about the cross. In a world filled full of strife and division, the gospel still has power to influence lives. And it reminds us that we have no right to be proud. We are not better than others. It reminds us that our efforts are no match for the cross. And it reminds us that every single person is deeply loved by God. How many think that kind of community can have a lot more influence in our culture than someone who's just angry or afraid? Let's bow our heads this morning. The work of God in our lives is so deep that it will come and it will separate what he is doing from everything we've known and been raised in our whole life. And that can often feel a little bit uncomfortable and we have to face our fears. And this is what I want you to know this morning. The grace of God is available to you. There's no place you can go on our planet where the grace of God is not available. And you will never lock eyes with a single person who wasn't created in the image and likeness of God and doesn't have access to that grace all because of what Christ did for us. So let us be people who can appreciate that maybe this person helped bring me to Christ. 
and appreciate that this person maybe taught me some things about Christ. And this church helped pave the way for others to discover Christ for themselves. And rather than it being a competition, we can just recognize we're in this together. That at the end of the day, there's only one Savior. And it's not the pastor of any church. And it's not the leader of any denomination. It's Jesus. And there's only one price that ever counted. And it's the price that Jesus paid on the cross. And that when we start understanding that truth, it changes how we think about how we live. And then we don't just reflexively repeat what our culture has ingrained in us. We take deliberate steps that are marked by grace. Father, help us learn these lessons today. Help us understand that looking at someone whose sinful lifestyle in our eyes makes them less than, help them understand that the fact that we are willing to treat them differently shows we are no better than them at all. Help us understand that your cross is what made the difference in our lives and it's what will make the difference in theirs. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me this morning.